ferocious man-eating monsters. Hello, I'm John Rossi. I'm a touring drummer with a passion for animal conservation. When I'm on the road, I spend as much time as possible visiting zoos, aquariums, and conservation organizations. Now, I want to share those places with you. I'll be talking to keepers, vets, conservationists, anyone who can help me in my mission of connecting my people to animals through their people. Join me on my raw safari. Hello, 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 and welcome to the podcast that is a birthday party today. The Rasafari Podcast. All right, y'all. So for those of you who have been following along, you know that in general, the vibe of this podcast is that it follows me around. I go and play the drums in Florida. Y'all get to learn about a bunch of Florida facilities that I visit. I go and play the drums in California. Now we're learning all about those places out in California. But this is going to be a departure from that, and with good reason. I am so incredibly happy that I have four amazing facilities within about a half-hour drive from my home. And one of those facilities is Adventure Aquarium in Camden, New Jersey. I have loved this aquarium since I moved to the Philly area seven years ago. And now I got them. I got them on my podcast. But I don't just happen to have an episode from Adventure Aquarium for you, although I do, and you're listening to it, so that's exciting. But I've actually got five episodes from Adventure coming your way. And um, this is this is kind of a cool story, so I want to share it with y'all. A few months ago, I attended a pretty cool event held at Adventure Aquarium. We, we talk about it in this interview, so I'm not going to give it away now. But part of my time there was just spent meeting a bunch of the staff and talking to people, getting to know them, plugging the heck out of my podcast. You know, the usual And some of the people I spoke with really seemed to get it and and encouraged me to reach out to the aquarium and and try and make contact with the PR team and get the ball rolling. So I did, and those early conversations led me to Lauren, the content marketing coordinator at Adventure Aquarium. And Lauren had such an awesome vision for how to use this podcast to not only further the message that Adventure Aquarium shares, but also to help me further and grow my podcast, which is just the coolest thing ever. You see, during certain months of the year, Adventure Aquarium has their little theme months. So there's Sea Turtle Awareness Month, Hippo Awareness Month. Penguin Awareness Month, and Shark Awareness Month. And also, this year, Adventure is celebrating their 30th birthday. 30 years of operation. Pretty exciting stuff. So, Lauren thought that we should do a five-episode series, but not, you know, a traditional series where it's just five weeks of Adventure Aquarium. We're going to start off today with their birthday episode, which is especially cool because we're also celebrating my birthday, which is March 31st, later this week. So this is birthday week for me and Adventure. And then at the top of next month, I'm going to come back with uh, one of the awareness months. We're starting with Penguin Awareness Month. And then every month, we're going to start our month with the Awareness Month episode for that animal for the next couple of months. So we'll be going back to California. We'll be touching some of our Arizona facilities. We'll be doing some other cool stuff. But at the top of each month, for the next couple of months, you are going to get to learn about whatever animal is the focus at Adventure that month, which I just I just think that's cool. This is going to be a lot of fun, y'all. And it's also connecting me to my home aquarium in a way that I just... Oh, I'm so excited about. This is this is such a beautiful thing. It really is. And uh, this episode starts off with a huge connection because the person that I'm speaking to, her name is Alex, and uh, you'll hear the story in the episode, but Alex is one of the people who has made a huge impact on me and my desire to do this pod. I'll, I'll let that story play out in the episode. But suffice to say, this is another one of those episodes with a real deep personal connection, which I know from, from feedback that y'all have sent me that y'all really love. 
Before we get to the interview, however, we do have a couple things that I want to take care of. First and foremost, and most importantly, if you are listening to this as it came out or shortly thereafter, I am doing a fundraiser with an amazing artist. The company is Peace, Love, and Tie-Dye, and we are raising money for Red Panda Network. You can get your own custom-made tie dye red panda t-shirt and if you can't picture what i'm talking about go to the insta go to the facebook you're going to see me promoting the heck out of it it's really cool it's 25 bucks it's a one of a kind piece of art that you get to wear on your chest and it supports red pandas as well as having some of the coolest art i've ever seen with any conservation projects so please go check that out at raw safari um and then also and then make sure you are, you know, following along on all of those platforms. You can also check out my regular merch at rossafari.com. And um, hey, if you're a new listener to this podcast, go to whatever podcast app you listen on and make sure you hit subscribe so you don't miss any episodes. All right, we need to run one quick ad and then we'll get to the interview. So here's that ad. Today's episode is brought to you by Daydreamer Studios. Do you have stories and expertise to share with the world? Have you ever thought about starting your own podcasts? There's no better time to start than now with the help of a trusted production partner. Daydreamer Studios is a full-service production company that takes all the stress off your plate. You can focus on creating engaging content while they focus on recording, editing, audio engineering, hosting, and publishing on 22 platforms. Log into the advanced remote system with one click and the Daydreamer team will be on the other end ready for you to record everything you have to say. Owned and operated by Daydreamer Network, Daydreamer Studios continues on the company's mission to empower storytellers of all kinds by making podcasting accessible to all. For more information and current promotions, visit daydreamernetwork.com slash studios. All right, so before we get into the episode, there's one little fact that I need to share with y'all, which is, I don't know if you know this, but the melody and lyrics to Happy Birthday are actually copyrighted, and you have to pay royalties if you use them. So um, I would now like to sing a completely uh, improvised song to Adventure Aquarium. <clears throat> Aww. Happy birth. Day to you, happy birthday to you, happy birth day, really cool place called Adventure Aquary, um, happy birth day to you. And now, without further ado, here is my interview with Alex from Adventure Aquarium. And yeah, you're going to hear Lauren once or twice too, because uh, we were having a party and it's fun for everyone to jump in. Enjoy. All right. So uh, let's start off by me asking you who you are, where we are, and what you do here. All right. So I am Alex. We are at Adventure Aquarium. I am a biologist here. Um, so I've been here for seven years, actually, seven years coming up tomorrow. Ooh, so congratulations. <laughs> Thank Happy you. anniversary. Thank you. Um, and right now I work with our jellies. Uh, so I started here as a biologist aide and kind of slowly worked my way up, worked with a few different galleries, but right now jellies are my main thing. So, All right. Well, jellies are interesting and we're going to have to have to talk about that. For sure. But we're specifically doing this episode today because we are celebrating the 30th birthday mm -hmm. of Adventure Aquarium. Um Weird question and probably <laughs> unanswerable, but I like being weird. Why are we calling it a birthday instead of a, an anniversary? Do we know? Uh, just uh, so we can kind of tie in some of the birthday celebrations that we have. Um, one big one that is part of the uh, birthday celebrations is if you have a birthday and want to come to the aquarium, you can come for free on your birthday. Ooh, I like it. Uh, we're also celebrating some big animal birthdays as well. Uh, one of our hippos, which uh, you'll get more into with our hippo podcast as well. So just to kind of tie uh, that birthday idea in a little bit more. 
Awesome. I love that. That was a really good answer <laughs> that you just made up spur of the moment, yeah. <laughs> uh, which I appreciate. <laughs> but that was good. No, that was that was really good. Um, very cool. So let's let's talk about you a little bit, though. Um, mm-hmm. Did you always know that you wanted to work with animals? Definitely. Uh, ever since I was a kid, loved animals. And as you know, young kid, I always wanted to be a veterinarian. But then kind of as I got more into animals, I realized I really liked the marine side of it. Uh, probably kind of the defining moment was a snorkeling trip in Cozumel with my Ooh, family. Nice. And just as soon as I jumped in, it's like you're in a whole different world. And that really captivated me. And kind of from that point on, knew I wanted to do marine biology. Nice. I always get a kick out of, so I interview a lot of people for this podcast <laughs> and almost everyone had their marine biology phase, but it's yeah. only the people that are at aquariums that are like, I stuck with it. Follow Everyone through. else is like, yeah. And then I decided that fish are stinky and moved on to land animals and turns out they're stinky too, but in a different way. <laughs> but so it was, it was the marine biologist dream. From, from an early age, huh? Yeah, probably uh, like middle school. I really knew that's what I wanted to do and kind of tried out a couple different ideas, but that's what I went to school for. Did an internship at the National Aquarium in Baltimore nice. and knew like, yep, this is my path. Sticking to it. Very cool. Very cool. You know, I'm now remembering, you just triggered something that in middle school we did, you know, the career day thing. Mm-hmm. And they always had a marine biologist. And it wasn't like they had a bunch of weird careers. It was like if you went to my my middle school, you basically believed that you could be like a car mechanic or an accountant <laughs> or a marine biologist. Like those are all even. And that's really not how that works. But yeah, anyway, just a weird <laughs> random fact. But um, I'm glad that you were able to stick with it. And I'm glad that you're here now. Um, so you really, you vibe with Adventure Aquarium. You are like not just a person who works here, but a person who is very enthusiastic about the place and, and yeah. talks about it and shares it a lot. What is it about Adventure that, that you love so much? Uh, well, so like I said, I've been here for seven years. This is my first job out of college. So I started out... Um, biologist aid entry level and just kind of learning the ropes and what I love about here is obviously the people they're very passionate about the animals and over the years we've gotten more and more into conservation and conservation theming and messaging getting involved with conservation initiatives and it shows that Adventure Aquarium really cares you know we care about the animals and we want to put that message out to the people and we want to get people involved and obviously with uh, animal people, animal folks, that's why we do what we do is to save the animals, educate people about them. Uh, it's because we care about animals and the environment. So it's a passion that uh, has really made me stuck here. That's awesome. Conservation is the goal of this podcast as well, mm-hmm. obviously. So very cool. Very cool. And, um, you know, you said that over the years you've gotten more into conservation here. What do you think it was that that prompted uh, the aquarium getting more involved in, in that? Well, uh, we have Liz, who is our zoological operations manager and also our conservation operator. And she's just done a great job with really delving into that and encouraging others to get more involved with that. Uh, And our uh, PR and marketing department has gotten really great with that messaging as well uh, and trying to make it not only fun, but also educational for our guests and the public. Very cool. Very important. I like that. Um, So what is your favorite animal here? All right, we'll be back after this quick break. Check out the new nature podcast that everyone is talking about. Birds of a feather talk together. If you like Radiolab or planet earth, you'll love birds of a feather talk together. Escape from the daily grind into the world of birds. Two experts and two amateurs talk about a different species every week. Recently, we talked about the osprey, burrowing owls, roadrunners, pigeons, giant hummingbirds, house wrens, sandhill cranes, and so many more. We have a lot of fun every week. Learn more about the incredible birds around you and some that you didn't know existed. Birds of a feather talk together. You're going to like these birds. I guarantee it. Well, I'm going to have to be biased and say the jellies. Uh, <laughs> Boo. You know they're not going to listen to the podcast, right? You can be I know. <laughs> But they really are uh, working with them. Uh, it's something that, you know, 
as a kid, and I feel like everybody says this, I could sit and watch jellies all day long at the aquarium. They're so peaceful and mesmerizing. And then getting to actually grow and raise them yourself, it's even more satisfying to sit and watch them. Uh, Being able to do that, it's a very cool feeling and it's a very niche part of this field. So I've really enjoyed that journey of getting more in depth about learning about jellies and their life cycle, which is really complicated and cool and I could talk about jellies for hours. <laughs> well, all right. Well, let's get right into that then. Um, I was going to later, but that was such a good segue that, um, yeah, so so talk to me about the jellies. What kind of jellies do you have here, for starters? So we have three different species of jellies. We have the moon jelly, uh, Pacific sea nettles, and then the upside down jellies as well. Uh, so we raise all of them here. And like I said, they have a very complicated life cycle. So what we typically think of as jellies uh, floating around that pulsing, uh, that is called the medusa form. And then uh, they do have male and female uh, medusa. So they will mate to form a planula larva, which is a free swimming organism. And then that will eventually settle down into a polyp, which is basically a jellyfish turned upside down, kind of like a really small anemone. Uh, And then that begins the asexual portion of the reproduction, which they will go through a process called strobilation in which they will bud off tiny little baby jellyfish called ephyra that are super, super cute. Uh, And it's really fun to (laughs) (laughs) raise them through that entire life cycle into the full grown. So all of the jellies that you see here, they've been raised at Adventure Aquarium. So again, I could talk about their life cycle forever, but I think that they're just really cool and things that Uh, A lot of people don't know about with jellies. Yeah, that's fascinating. So where do you do all of this? Um, So actually kind of right right behind us is our jelly holding area, one of our main jelly holding uh, areas. I do have another small one upstairs, but we have these big trays full of bins of uh, little Petri dish plates that all the polyps grow on. So I maintain those and then have various size of tanks that the smaller jellies can go into. Uh, and then once they get a little bit bigger, they can move into a larger one and so on until they're ready to go on to exhibit. Okay. And so how long do like each of these phases last? So polyps can live for decades. Um, we've had uh, most of our polyps for well over probably at least 10 years, uh, and they can live for quite a long time. The medusa phase uh, is a bit more varied. So with the moon jellies, that's typically going to be about a year to a year and a half. Whereas the Pacific sea nettles, that's going to be a bit longer. They can usually live for several years. Interesting. Very cool. How do you decide when it's time to move from a Petri dish to the (laughs) next, you know, tank or whatever? So typically with a fire, I'll keep them in a small uh, dish of water and change that water daily. And then once they kind of start to form that bell and kind of, uh, Like with moon jellies, they have a more kind of brownish, orangish color. Once they start to form a bell and get that more clear color that you think of with moon jellies, uh, then that's when I'll move them into a smaller system, uh, still a little bit um, bigger than what they have, and then kind of keep going. I have, like I said, various sizes of tanks that they can grow into. That's really cool. Are these all closed systems where you're in charge of filtration and all of that as well, or is that all part of the bigger... Aquarium picture. Yep. So it's all closed systems. So I have um, three holding systems, jelly warm holding, jelly cold holding, and tropical jelly holding. So uh, they are all their own three systems, and I'm responsible for maintaining the water and filtration in those systems as well. Very interesting. (laughs) So this is its own little like micro aquarium. Yeah. (laughs) That's really cool. Nice. Um, So, all right, let's... Uh, One other thing, actually, before we move away from jellies, which is just for my listeners, you keep using the word jelly and not using the word jellyfish. (laughs) And I know there's a reason for that. Can you talk about that a little bit? Yes. So uh, the reason a lot of Aquarius call jellies jellies is because they are not fish. Uh, It's kind of a similar thing with calling sea stars instead of starfish. Uh, And that's not to say, you know, if someone calls it a jellyfish, I'm not going to yell at them or anything. It's still widely accepted, and uh, I still say jellyfish as well. But we do try to reiterate the fact that jellies are not fish. Right. Yeah, makes sense. Very (laughs) cool. Very cool. All right. So, um, you know, when we set up this whole 
five episode arc at Adventure. Um, this one was set up to be kind of the general intro to Adventure and to talk about yes. the birthday and to talk just about Adventure as an adventure. Um, and so there are a bunch of little things that I want to touch on, <laughs> but I have to ask. Being here, I'm assuming around 40 hours a week or whatever, and now maybe that you're in your back lab, this doesn't happen so much. But how often do you get the music that plays at this place stuck in your head? Oh, all the time. We all <laughs> sing the songs. Lauren is dying behind <laughs> us, by the way. <laughs> Especially the frog wall songs upstairs that have actual lyrics. I will be singing those all the time without realizing it. <laughs> nice. I love it. I actually, so I came here. Um, I didn't know if I was allowed to, but I did anyway. One night y'all were open late for a um, sensory friendly mm -hmm. evening. And despite not needing that, I thought I wanted to come check it out for the zoo news stuff that I do for Rasafari and also because I like being in aquariums late. It's really cool. Um, <laughs> but but the official reason was for, for Rasafari. And um, I was walking through and something just felt off to me. Like it was lovely. It was wonderful. I met Cassie the penguin and it was a life-changing experience. <laughs> That's actually where I met people on staff here who then connected me to, to everyone here, which is why we're doing this interview right now. Oh, like it was such a great experience. <laughs> But I realized it was because the music was off. Yep. And I could hear it playing in my head, and it was throwing me that I couldn't hear it as I walked through. The uh, the the music here is its own special thing. Oh, yes. Um, it's very, its own breed Very of music. catchy. Yeah. yeah, it really it draws you in. In sometimes kind of the way that you cannot get out of your head. Yes, yes. Oh, man, that's – that's yeah. I, I always think of this place in terms of the music as well as like, you know, Turtles and stuff, um, which also leads me to we're not going to go too deep into turtles here, but but do you remember when we first met? I do. <laughs> do you remember that story? Okay. So I just need to share this with with my listeners, um, and I would, I would love your take on this. So um, there is a uh, behind the scenes where you can go and meet sea turtles and mm -hmm. feed sea turtles, and it is the greatest thing that you can do with your life. I highly recommend <laughs> doing that. Um, and you were running that when Zoe and I came to do the, the turtle thing. And um, – uh, as a side note of all of this, there is um, – or there used to be. I don't know if there's still – if you guys still do this. But for Sea Turtle Awareness Week, um, there are these wristbands, the the Live Strong type silicone, whatever, wristbandy things that you can wear. And uh, they say, I love sea turtles, and they have a little sea turtle on them. And I have one, and I wear it all the time. And my sea turtle bracelet had broken, and I mentioned that to you. <laughs> and so, so tell everyone what you did. Uh, so – like I said, you were very passionate about sea turtles and conservation, and I could tell that. And the way you told the story about how much the bracelet meant to you, uh, I knew that uh, obviously sea turtles and conservation meant a lot. And we have tons of this stuff uh, for our Sea Turtle Awareness Weekend. So bracelets, trading cards, all sorts of fun little knickknacks. So you had expressed wanting a new bracelet. So I went and grabbed you a nice goodie bag full of the bracelet and trading cards. And you were so appreciative. And not only that, but later informed me that you uh, helped to educate people uh, talking about plastic straws and how you can use reusable straws. And that's one way to help the environment and how kind of that – um, action just spread. So just reiterates how great it is to work here at a place that cares so much about conservation and to be able to spread that message onward. Y'all, it was so cool. So <laughs> Alex is being humble and, and kind to me as well. First of all, y'all know me on this podcast and you know that I am a big freaking dork and that when I nerd out, I nerd out hard. <laughs> so here is this big, dorky, sweaty guy that just met sea turtles and was losing his mind and acting like a little child and talking about this bracelet and and um, just being the biggest nerd. And Alex just goes, wait here, and disappeared for a minute. And while she's gone, I'm like squealing a little bit <laughs> because I'm like, oh, is she going to go get me a new bracelet? Is I going to get a new bracelet? And when she came back, this goodie bag was so good. There's pencils and the trading cards and multiple bracelets because I remember you saying, <laughs> I know that it'll probably break again. And that hasn't happened yet, but I still have my backups just in case. <laughs> and um, it was such a really important moment to me um, in that – it was one of those 
early interactions with zookeepers and biologists and aquarists that made me realize how special they are, which made me realize that I wanted to share their stories, which is why I'm doing this podcast. It's awesome. Um, so having you on here means a lot to me, not just because you're cool, um, <laughs> but also because you are one of the people who made me realize that this should be a project. And by the time this drops, there will have been over 100,000 downloads of this podcast wow. and people learning the conservation message and learning – you alls stories and and you going and getting those silly little bracelets and not <laughs> yeah, and I, I guarantee you that you told your coworkers that day or your partner that evening or something I met this guy today and he was such a dork <laughs> but hopefully in a like laughy positive dorky way maybe but um, yeah that really I mean it had an honest impact and and that impact keeps spreading through the podcast and everything. well thank you that means a lot and uh I can definitely understand being the dorky, overly excited about things, but that's what I love about doing these encounters is and interacting with guests like you who are really into it is it makes it more fun for us. It makes it uh, makes me feel good that other people can then take that message and spread it on because those are the types of people that are going to go and tell everybody about it. And that's exactly what we want. So. That's awesome. awesome. I love that. That's so cool. Um, and I also love that I'm doing this now and get to like share these stories with those people. Like yeah. that's just so <laughs> – it's all just so special. Um, and thank you for being a part of that. Um, let's let's talk about your, your coworkers here a little bit because I've now met a bunch of y'all. <laughs> and there is a really good group of people at this aquarium. So, yeah. so talk about the people here. Yeah. Uh, everybody here, like I said, we're – is so passionate about the animals and that's a big reason of why I've stayed here so long is it's it's like a second family you know and you're working weird hours you're working weekends and holidays so you get really close with these people and when you're doing uh, animal procedures and you all have to be uh, working with a shark and basically entrusting your lives with each other you do form a really close bond with these people and yeah, it's just great to be around such passionate, like-minded uh, people here. That's awesome. Yeah. I know that you have a really good friend who works here as well, Sam. Yeah. And I actually <laughs> just ran into her. So oh, we're like Insta buds, <laughs> like we've never met before, but we've chatted on Instagram just through all of this. Yep. <laughs> and like she saw me from distance was like, ah, and like it was really exciting too. Yeah. And I just, I love, I love that the connectedness goes beyond the building. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that's really cool. Yeah. Sam, she's one of my closest friends here. We hang out all the time and uh, definitely has over the years become one of my best friends and has been a mentor to me here as well. So really awesome bonds with these people. Nice. Very cool. Very cool. Um, now you mentioned that you do behind the scenes stuff and, mm -hmm. and that was our whole story. Um, do you do a lot of that or did you do a lot of that before jelly time? Yeah. So we kind of rotate with our schedule so that everybody kind of gets a chance to do different ones. So right now I'm doing mostly our shark and ray encounter, uh, but we also have the sea turtle encounter uh, as well as our uh, kind of behind the scenes full building tour as well. So we all will just kind of take turns and rotate with that. So I'm really curious. <laughs> what percentage would you say you don't have to be that mathematical um of guests are like super passionate do you have people who come back and pay all this money to do this thing and then are like yeah i don't i don't really care that i'm here like <laughs> like talk to me about that yeah um i would say there's a good percentage of people who are very into it some people um especially with like the shark and rays can be a bit timid and definitely a little bit nervous you can tell sure um, and it's funny with the shark and ray encounter, you would think people would be more afraid of the sharks, but people are terrified of the stingrays. Uh, and I think it's because they, they're all over you. They come right up and people kind of get overwhelmed by that. So anytime I've seen people get overly nervous or kind of not wanting to participate in something, it's never the sharks. It's always <laughs> the stingrays, which is the funniest thing to me. Um, but yeah, I mean, you definitely get people who are quieter and uh, sometimes you just can't tell if they're as into it or if they're just kind of taking it all in. But you, when, like I said, when you get the people who are very into it and asking a lot of questions, those are the people that make it so fun for us. Like, I love when people are asking questions and talking the entire time, because even though it might make for a longer encounter and take a little bit more time out of my day, 
those are the people that I'm getting through to and getting that message to. And those are the people that are going to be spreading that conservation message as well, which is why we do those encounters. So yeah, I'd say it's a good mix of people who are you know a little bit more quiet and a little more outgoing and excited and asking those questions. All right, we'll be back after this quick break. Hi, this is Kathy Hill from the Indian River Lagoon National Estuary Program. We're all about restoration, projects, and progress this season on One Lagoon, One Voice. Learn about the great strides the lagoon community is taking to restore and protect the Indian River Lagoon. Each week, we dive deep into discussions with scientists, resource managers, and nonprofit leaders to explore lagoon issues and solutions. From oyster reefs to clam restoration, algae blooms to muck, you'll learn all about the projects we're tackling to bring the Indian River Lagoon back to health. Click the link in the show notes to follow One Lagoon, One Voice, learn about the IRL Council, and explore our unique lagoon. Okay, that's cool. That's cool. Um, I'm curious, what would you say the the general? And again, I'm I'm super asking you to generalize here, but um, like, what's the knowledge base of somebody who comes to say meet sea turtles or to meet you know sharks or whatever? Do they know a lot about the animals and are just looking for that, or is it literally just like, ooh, I like turtles? And then you're like, well, okay, so there's a green sea turtle and a loggerhead, and they're like, wait, what? Like, where <laughs> where does that fall in general? Uh, do you know what's funny is that the people who uh, tend to be the most knowledgeable are usually the kids. <laughs> they are the ones that, I mean, they're probably the ones that convince their parents to sign up for <laughs> this. And But I've had you know, young kids, seven, eight years old, come in and just be totally, have all of this knowledge about sea turtles and or sharks and like be spouting off facts to me that I'm, that I'm surprised that they know. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I'd say definitely the kids are very into it, but you also get some adults who are very knowledgeable as well. Um, most people know kind of some of the basic facts, but I do always like to throw in a couple that I think people won't know. And there's always some that, you know, really, oh, wow, shock people. Um, so yeah. Okay, definitely that makes it. sense. And you know what the next question is going to be. Then. <laughs> Tell me a couple of the facts that shock people. Um, so one I always like to do with the sea turtle encounter is to talk about why green sea turtles are called green sea turtles because they're not really green, um, <laughs> but they eat so many vegetables. So they eat a lot of greens uh, that actually makes the fat layer under their skin turn green in color. So that's really where their name comes from. And people kind of, oh, you know, think about that uh, with sea turtles also talking about their kind of conservation messaging. Uh, one that a lot of people really don't think about is with light pollution. So sea turtles, when they hatch, they use the light of the moon to find their way back out to the ocean. But a major problem with that is uh, different beaches having lots of uh, populations on the shore, houses, restaurants, etc., that have their lights on late at night and actually disorient the sea turtles. Um, so a lot of places now are doing these lights out policies where they will have to keep the lights off when they know the nests are going to be hatching so that sea turtles can find their way. And a lot of people are like, wow, I've never, that would never have even crossed my mind or thought it. But then you do get the couple people who are like, oh yeah, we vacation at this place and we do, you know, we see that all the time. So uh, really cool to be able to share those little facts and tidbits that people might not know about. Yeah, that is really cool. And it's so neat, by the way, the light pollution thing to see in action. Um, I spent a bunch of time down in Florida. I was gigging down in Florida for like eight weeks. And I did a couple different episodes with Moat Marine Lab, one of which was we actually went out and found like sea turtle nests and documented and and put up the um, – you know, stuff to keep people away from them and stuff. Mm -hmm. And just seeing the the steps taken with, you know, everyone. And man, the area that we were in was like rich people, which oftentimes <laughs> you think are the people who might think they're above the rules or whatever, mm -hmm. you know? Nah, they were super cool about it. And every light was off or red if it was necessary. And it was, yeah. it was very cool to see. Yeah. These beach towns, they, they really care. The people are yeah. really passionate about it. So it's very cool to see. Absolutely. All right, so we need to talk about some animals other than jellies because I know you're <laughs> fascinated, but, um, you know, for my listeners. And one of the the animals that is here that I've actually had the experience of meeting and that I would love to chat with you about is my buddy, Callisto the octopus. What can you tell me about her? Uh, so, yeah, I actually used to work with our giant Pacific octopuses. Um, I don't work with them anymore, but I do get to interact with them here and there. Um, but octopuses are 
super, another super cool animal to work with. And as you know, have very much individual personalities. And Callisto is one that is very outgoing, very loves to come and interact with people and is actually one of the most gentle octopuses I've met. A lot of them have a lot of pull and want to you know, grab you and pull you in. And she just kind of gently tastes and grabs onto you. She is strong, though. She let's, is strong. Let's not <laughs> downplay the strength just for the no. people that are listening that have never met an octopus um like you're right she's not rude about it <laughs> but you can really feel that strength. oh yeah. yeah and that's why we have a rule with working with our octopuses that you never let them get more than two arms on you because they are that strong and they will pull you in if they get the chance to and that sounds like an easy rule to follow yeah but it's actually not <laughs> it sometimes can be because challenging how they sometimes. move and everything right yeah um you know i i had two arms on me and suddenly there was a third one coming and i was like ah I don't, how, where did that come from? Um, but yeah, so so what's it like working with Callisto? It's awesome being able to work with these animals. And like I said, very much have their own personality. So you really get to learn those individual animals. Uh, so the octopuses that I worked with, they were Gamora and Nebula. Uh, and kind of a similar with what we have on our octopuses now, uh, Gamora was uh, very outgoing and loved to come and meet people, whereas Nebula was a bit more shy and reserved and kind of like to hide in her den a little bit more. Which also fits those character personalities. It does. The Marvel <laughs> it stuff, does. which I like. That which I loved. Good. I was so happy that I named them correctly. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was great being able to see these two different personalities and uh, kind of really form that bond. And even Nebula, you could tell being the more shy one, she was uh, very trusting with me because I worked with her every day and she knew me, uh, whereas other people she would really have to take the time to warm up to. So that's a, a really cool thing to see with working with them is that they actually get to know these individual people um, and and have that bond with you. So octopuses are incredibly smart. And yes, friends, it's octopuses, not <laughs> octopi. I'm sorry to disappoint you all. You can also do octopodes, but that's because it's great. But <laughs> octopuses is correct. But um, so they're super smart. Mm -hmm. And if they lived long and came out of the water, it would take over the earth. Yep. <laughs> um, but what do you do for enrichment for octopuses? Uh, so they have basically just looks like a kid's toy box uh, full of fun little toys and puzzles so we can give them all sorts of different enrichment from jars to um, little kid puzzles and building blocks, giant Legos. Um, we've given them hamster balls and just pool toys, all sorts of fun different things that they can uh, have just either some tactile enrichment or we can put food inside of it that they can figure out how to get the food out. Um, We've even just had things like watering cans so we kind of gently pour water and kind of creates a fun little sensation for them, like a waterfall. So they love to not only interact with people, but uh, interact with their environment. And uh, so we want to make sure that they are stimulated because they're so smart that we're not just throwing food in for them. That they're actually uh, challenged to get that food. So uh, they, like they have... So many toys. It's crazy. <laughs> the, the first time I played with her, we played with Legos. It was yeah. cool. It was That was really uh, a weird and neat experience. <laughs> um, and is it correct that they have a kind of touch memory, um, for lack of a better way to put it, so that like if we were to go down there after this, she would be like, oh. Oh, yeah, you're that dude. We've hung yes. out a couple times now. Yes, yeah, so their suction cups, not only do they obviously use it to grab and manipulate things, but they can also taste with that. So they can taste a difference uh, like with different people. So that's when they, you know, how they can recognize uh, different keepers, guests, and such. That's so cool. And Very when cool. you use the word taste, um, <laughs> let's just, uh, w what does that mean? Because they're not biting right you. and it's i just i want to like <laughs> i want my listeners to understand because i feel like octopuses are wildly just not understood you know <laughs> not even misunderstood just not understood so yeah yeah, yeah so it's just uh like i said being able to uh kind of that that different sense of you know not necessarily that they're biting onto you and tasting, but that they can differentiate between those um, you know, different people or different food items as well. All right, we'll be back after this quick break. Animals are taking center stage in research, not just as objects for human benefit, but as beings with rich histories and geographies. Join me, Claudia Herzenfelder, on the Animal Turn podcast as I interview leading scholars about emerging ideas and concepts in animal studies. 
Each season delves into a unique theme, revealing how concepts intertwine or diverge. And this kind of discussion encourages a deeper reflection about animals and their broader contexts. So far, the podcast has considered themes as wide-ranging as law, politics, sound, the urban, and biosecurity. If you are interested in animals and unpacking the ways we know them, find the Animal Tone podcast wherever you listen. Cool. All right. So, um, yeah, let's, let's, all right. So we've done jellies and octopodes. <laughs> so, um, let's talk about some of the other weirdness here. We just seem to be hitting the weird animals. Yeah. <laughs> and I really like that because that's one thing aquariums are good at. There's some weird stuff, you know, floating around. So, so tell me about more weirdness here. Uh, weirdness. Well, uh, one, that I really love because, again, it's one that I've worked with. Uh, but if you're interested, I could tell more about it. Our piranha. Yes. Uh, <laughs> awesome. Another wildly misunderstood yes. animal. I love this. <laughs> this is so good. So piranha, um, they're, uh, they were my first uh, animal that I worked with uh, as a biologist. So when I got promoted to biologist one and had my own gallery of animals, uh, the piranha falls was my main exhibit. So I got to know them pretty closely and, like you said, very misunderstood animals. Uh, much like sharks, uh, they have this reputation of being this crazy, man-eating, ferocious fish when really is not the case at all. Um, they are more scavengers than anything else. Uh, I have been in that exhibit with them. They're terrified. They go and hide <laughs> in the corner. <laughs> um, you are rather intimidating. Yes. <laughs> um, so... Uh, and their kind of origin of where that story comes from is pretty cool if I can delve into that. Yeah, please. Um, so obviously portrayed in the movies a lot as these crazy, ferocious creatures, and we've seen that. But kind of where that origin story was was actually with uh, former President Theodore Roosevelt. So he, uh, as a lot of people probably know, was this kind of great adventurer, explorer, and went on all these crazy expeditions. Uh, well, one that he went to was deep in the rainforests of Brazil. And the Brazilians, they knew he was coming and they were excited to have this kind of celebrity former president be coming to their neck of the woods. And uh, so they wanted to make his visit super exciting and they knew he was a thrill seeker and liked adventure. So what they did was netted off this section of the river uh, and just for weeks caught piranha and just threw him in there and just let them be in there without food for weeks on end. Uh, and then when Theodore Roosevelt comes, they say, you know, you got to be careful you don't go in the waters because you'll you and your men, you'll be attacked and eaten by these man eating piranha. And Roosevelt's kind of, you know, a little skeptical of that. But then to show him, they take an old sick cow and push it in the river where all those starving piranha are. <laughs> And, of course, they then devour this cow, um, which then Theodore writes about and tells of these ferocious man-eating monsters. Um, but it was a very artificial, created, curated thing. Oh, no way. I had no clue. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. And, um, you know, I, I always equate it to, you know, if you lock me in a room for weeks without food and then throw in a rotisserie chicken, <laughs> of course I'm going to devour it. But... Um, for the most part, anytime I was feeding, and we feed them multiple times a day, anytime I was feeding people, oh, she's going to feed, she's going to feed, come on, are you going to throw a whole like chicken in there, are you going to throw a whole fish, and I'm just throwing some handfuls of food, and the piranha are kind of lazily going after it, and they're like, that's it? <laughs> <laughs> yes, normally piranha are very <laughs> timid scavengers, they're not going to be you know, attacking animals. I mean, not to say that they don't go after animals, but it's usually those that are sicker or weaker and usually only when it's um, kind of the dry season when food is limited. So uh, much like sharks, do prana attacks occasionally happen? Yes, but it's so rare, uh, but just so highlighted by the media when it does happen and right. we've just turned them into these crazy monsters, but uh, very misunderstood animals. That's really fascinating. <laughs> I did not know that story. I love telling That's that story. <laughs> really cool. Um, and I, I, uh, I noticed you mentioned you said piranha, so mm -hmm. it's not piranhas, mm -hmm. or so it is either piranha or piranha pod. So no, I, I kid, I kid, I kid. But um, so piranha falls has a unique thing about it, which is um, a whole thunderstorm mm -hmm. that happens. 
what is the point of that? Why? What? How does that help with messaging? Talk to me about that. Yeah. So I actually uh, took over that exhibit when it was in transition. So it used to be Arazu Falls, um, and we had some large arapaima uh, and some other different fish in there, but we transitioned it into Piranha Falls and kind of gave it this makeover with this rainstorm. Uh, and it's just to educate um, kind of that ecosystem, delicate ecosystem in the rainforest and how those storms uh, really provide life for the animals, for the people, for the plants, everything living in there. So uh, it kind of uh, takes you through and there's a little bit of narration to show how uh, these storms uh, are a very important part of the ecosystem there. Um, And uh, just a really cool way to highlight that specific part of um, the Amazon and just very cool uh, to be able to highlight that and kind of immerse you in that storm experience. Very cool. And then speaking of messaging and teaching, the upstairs area of the aquarium is um, horribly mislabeled since I'm an adult and I like going there, (laughs) but um, it is, it's kind of set up for kids. It's a a kid's aquarium area. Um, So just, um, yeah, talk to me about some of the residents there and, and, how that's all set up. Uh, yeah, so we have our uh, kids zone. Um, so it's frog alley. So it has lots of different species of frogs. Um, and then it ki- kind of goes into our coral area. Um, and corals are uh, something that we've really kind of expanded our collection here as well and the conservation messaging on that. Um, so one way that we've expanded that um, that. Uh, not necessarily is present to the public, but uh, it is an area that you can see on one of our behind the scenes tours uh, as we've expanded into uh, uh, top of shark realm. We have an area where we are uh, operating our Florida reef tract rescue program. So we have three systems up there of rescue corals um, from the Florida barrier reef. Um, So we're part of a program with AZA association of zoos and aquariums that, uh, takes these corals and we, along with several other institutions, have them housed uh, and are able to raise them here because out in the wild, they are facing a tissue loss disease. So the idea is to keep a a nice healthy population of corals uh, in captivity that could one day be reintroduced and help repopulate that area once um, that disease either kind of wipes itself out or they've figured out a way to eradicate it. Uh, So another great conservation initiative that we've uh, taken part in. And for those who are listening, if you're caught up on everything, um, we did an entire episode from the uh, Coral Gene Bank at Moat Marine Lab down in Florida, which is a big part of that same project Mm -hmm. and everything. So if you'd like to learn more about that project, you can go and check out that episode from Moat Marine Lab's Coral Gene Bank. (laughs) Um, But anyway, turning it back to adventure. Yeah, that is really cool that y'all do that. And um, up in the... The kids of all ages <clears throat> zone, as I'm going to call it. Um, there's a uh, there's a there's a caiman up there, um, and 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 talk to me about that that particular gorgeous creature. Sorry, what did you say? The caiman. <laughs> The oh, Cayman. Cayman. Oh, Cayman. Cayman. <laughs> I, I've heard it pronounced both ways a lot. <laughs> so yeah. I, I I was not I was not registered. <laughs> but you say caiman. Um, I say caiman. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, So yeah, uh, Blue is our Cayman upstairs. Um, She's another favorite. Uh, She actually, she did have the name Blue before Jurassic World came out. Nice, (laughs) nice, nice. Okay, so you're a nerd like me. I'm enjoying, we've got Marvel references, we've got Jurassic references. I'm enjoying this. Um, So yeah, Blue is our dwarf Cayman. And she's right upstairs, kind of one of the first things that you'll see in our kids zone. Um, And I always, always, always get asked, probably every day, if she is real. <laughs> I have never been at that exhibit for more than a minute yep. where somebody didn't oh. say, that's not real, or ask. Is that, is that, uh, you ever see that thing move? Yeah. Yep. So um, I always, to prove it, will say, you know, squat down and look just under her throat. You can see her breathing. Um, but they're ambush predators, so they sit and wait for their food to come. So sometimes, if you're lucky, you might get to see a feeding. I know we've posted some on our social media as well, and it's very cool to see them uh, feed. But we uh, feed a nice variety of different types of fish, uh, even uh, chicken and quail. So she gets a nice variety in her diet. And um, that's probably the most active you're ever going to see her. Uh, <laughs> once in a while, I'll see her moving around and people go crazy. But uh, <laughs> I always get that question for sure. 
Awesome. And then um, along with the frogs, which you have some really cool species of frogs, by the way, mm-hmm. um, axolotls. Yes. Yeah. Tell me about <laughs> your axolotl exhibit. Yes. So we have our um, uh, arrested development axolotls. So they stay in their juvenile phase of as a salamander. Um, and they're found only in one specific area. Uh, they're called Mexican water dogs is another name for them, <laughs> which is, I think, a really cool name. Um but I always uh, do people do hear people say they look like a, a dragon, and they are kind of this really cool, um, interesting creature that doesn't look like anything that you would expect to see, and uh, uh, one that people always kind of I feel like a lot of people don't know about axolotls, and they see them and they're kind of surprised by how they look, and uh, really cool to see them uh, in that phase, and they they just stay in there, so that's why it's called arrested development. I like it. And um, I'm curious now. I have total faith and I trust the aquarium. But my understanding has always been that axolotls are solitary creatures. And yet there are a couple that live together there. Does it work okay? Is it is everything good there? I mean, I assume everything's good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, no, we've never had any issues with them. They kind of just keep to themselves. Uh, we actually have had uh, our axolotls breed here. Um, so the ones that you see on exhibit are actually ones that were um, bred from previous population of axolotls. And at one point we had like 400 of these guys. It was crazy. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, they get along pretty well. Uh, when they're younger, we do tend to keep them separate. Um, but then as they grow older into adults, they kind of just mind their own business and keep to themselves. Interesting. Very cool. Very cool. And I'm going to get dumped if I don't ask you about (laughs) one particular fish because it is Zoe's favorite, um, which is the mandarin dragon net. I think I'm saying that right. Yeah. 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 Woo. And um, for people who don't know, this may be the most beautiful fish ever, 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 ever. Um, But but what can you tell me about the mandarin dragon net that lives upstairs? Uh, Yes. So we actually introduced them as part of kind of uh, our campaign with the Splash and Bubbles TV show. Um, so it's one of the characters there. But we do have uh, one in our uh, coral exhibit and then one in the uh, Birth Reverse RC Horse exhibit upstairs as well. Um, so they're just, yeah, really cool little guys. They can You'll see them kind of just perch up on a rock and they just kind of swim around looking for food. And uh, so we feed them a nice variety. They eat like very tiny uh brine shrimp, mycids, so we give them a nice variety of that, uh, live foods as well. Um, but just a very pretty fish and uh, cool to see them just kind of poking their head out. And uh, sometimes they're a little bit tricky to find. I was going to say, they're like shy, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Very hard to get pictures of. <laughs> yes, yes, but uh, if you come around feeding time, you definitely see them out and about a little more. <laughs> nice. Very cool. Very cool. Um, so I'm curious and, you know, I talk to, I do a lot of zoos. Mm -hmm. Um, it took, and, and I, I blame a certain not great documentary for this, but it took a lot longer to get into aquariums than it did for zoos for my podcast. Only recently has the aquarium world opened up to me, um, which I'm really excited about, (laughs) uh, But, um, you know, at zoos, it's like every animal pretty much gets named. And I know that that's not quite as common (laughs) at aquariums. Um, I'm guessing you're not naming every polyp of of jelly. I have (laughs) hundreds, thousands of animals that I could never and I couldn't tell the difference between them. Sure, sure. So how do you decide when something, you know, does the mandarin dragon net not get a name, but then, you know, uh, a specific other thing does? How does that work? Yeah, there's definitely some animals that do have names like all of our big um, animals in ocean realm uh, the sea turtles the hammerhead shark um, all of the penguins have names so there's definitely some animals like that and then other animals that just kind of develop these weird nicknames (laughs) um, by the staff and they just kind of lovingly get that like uh, one that is probably my favorite is in our uh, shark and ray encounter when you go into our stingray lagoon we have all sorts of stingrays in there mostly cow nose and there is one cow nose in there that's much smaller than the rest uh, and we call her tiny tina uh, so that's one that has just developed a nickname. There's no others in there that have a name, but it's just kind of an affectionate thing from uh, the aquarists. I actually got to see her up at the top, and she, oh, yeah. she's very tiny <laughs> she and is. definitely stands out. You cannot miss it. Yeah. <laughs> that's pretty great. Cool. Is it easy for you to connect to animals when they, they don't have names and when there are so many and stuff? Like, do you still build that relationship? Yeah. I mean, it's definitely different. Like, working with the octopus is a lot different than working with the jellies because the jellies, I'm not getting to know 
know them individually. They don't have names and personalities like the octopuses do. Uh, but it's still uh, a different type of bond where, you know, I'm, I'm raising them. I'm responsible for their care. And so getting to see them go from this tiny little Ephira all the way to a full-grown Medusa where they're on exhibit, um, it's a different type of bond for sure, but it's still there. Okay. Very cool. What is the proudest thing that you have done in seven years at this aquarium? Oh, jeez. Um, you can even say two <laughs> if you want to. Actually, an initiative that I will be doing in uh, just a short while uh, is I've brought a microplastics issue uh, to the aquarium as kind of a new initiative for our conservation programs. So... Um, Pairing with the Plastic Wave Project, um, they are doing this really great program that's kind of uh, analyzing the accumulation of microplastics on our shores. Uh, so in a little while, we're going to be going down to a uh, few blocks down the road to the uh, waterfront of our uh, river uh, right outside and going to be taking samples to see the different concentrations of microplastics. Um, and not only is that... Uh, very interesting to see it here, but also kind of showing how all the water here that's leading out to the ocean. And so anything that we could uh, put in the water here is getting carried into the ocean where it can harm our marine life. Um, and along with the microplastics, we also do uh, river sweeps throughout the summer. So we'll go out and to that same area and clean up the river. Uh, and there's always just so, so much trash. I mean, we'll clean it all up and you go down a week later and it looks like it wasn't touched. So it's definitely something that's hard to see, but also you know, does feel good to be able to do something to help out with that. And it's something that we can also bring to the attention of our guests and highlight that and encourage them to get involved as well with cleaning up their communities. That is really cool. Uh, have you ever thought of expanding that to when you guys do cleanups, having like guests be able to volunteer as well? Yeah. Like so we're kind of still very new. So we're still kind of in that, uh, beginning phases, but definitely something that I'd like to uh, first expand more into the aquarium and then would definitely like to get, you know, have a day of getting guests involved would be awesome. That would be really cool. Yeah. Um, keep me posted on that. I'll yeah. talk about it on my Zoo News episodes and stuff oh, like awesome. that and like try to promote it. Um, that's really cool. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I love that when I asked what your proudest thing was, it was a conservation thing and yeah. not just like an animal <laughs> thing. And I say just an animal thing, but like which is amazing, obviously, but that's really cool. Shows where your heart is. That's awesome. Thank you. Yeah, very, very cool. So let's talk about the dual identity of this um, of this aquarium. And I know that sounds very deep, and it's not. <laughs> All I mean is that y'all are in Camden, but you're on the water, and Philadelphia is right there. And if you go in the gift shop, there is stuff that says Philadelphia, and yeah. <laughs> stuff that says Camden. And um, how did like – how does that work? And, and do you find that having, you know, there are the two communities that come together here and, and how, do, how does all of that impact what happens at the aquarium? Yeah, definitely. I mean, being, we're so close right across the bridge. Um, definitely those, those two communities are close and we have a lot of people here who live in Philly and come and work. And so there's that community involvement that way. Um, but also we're kind of, you know, a big attraction and kind of located close to the other Philly attractions. So uh, I know there's different programs that will kind of involve uh, all the different places together and kind of create that community um, within those different institutions. Um, and you definitely obviously have the different sides, the Jersey and the Philly, but uh, like I said, being we're so close we kind of consider ourselves a part of it. So uh, we do like to tie in and stay involved as well. Cool. Very cool. Uh, is there anything else that you want to talk about with Adventure here? All right. We'll be back after this quick break. What if I told you scientists discovered a hundred new species in the deep ocean? Why did crocodiles survive extinction? Megalodon. How did it go extinct? Hey, it's me, Boris Galante, wildlife biologist. You might know me from Joe Rogan's podcast or my various TV shows like Extinct or Alive and Shark Week. Join me and my friends as we dive into the wild world of animal anomalies and everything wildlife. Don't miss out. Click here to uncover these mind-blowing animal mysteries. So I believe I should touch on our, a little bit more on our 30th yeah, birthday celebration. Um, 
So like I said, uh, one of the big things that we're doing is on your birthday, you can come to the aquarium for free. We also have our... Um, is it weird that I'm a member and can come for free whenever, <laughs> but I still want to come on my... I'm bummed. I'm gonna Just be, to get yeah, that, yeah. yeah I'm, I'm, not, I'm not even going to be in town on my birthday. My birthday is March 31st, and I really wish that I could come, <laughs> even though I'm a member and can come for free whenever. But that, that is a really cool initiative, though. It's time for... Interrupting. 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 Interrupting John. Mm. And y'all, this is yet another reason why I love the amazing people that work at these amazing facilities. So I told you in the intro about Lauren and how she helped me set all this up and is super awesome. And you can hear her laughing and commenting in the back with all of these adventure uh, episodes. And, um, you know, Lauren said that obviously I can I can come back whenever as a member, but that since I was missing my birthday, it was a bummer because there are birthday stickers. You get a sticker on your birthday. So after we did the interviews on this day, she then walked me to the front desk of the aquarium and got me a birthday sticker so that even though I won't be at the aquarium, I can wear it on my birthday and celebrate with them. It's such a small thing, but it's really meaningful. And she was really focused on making it happen. And it's that kind of detail that shows who these people are in a different way that is just amazing to me. So thank you, Lauren. Anyway, back to the interview. Well, as a member, you can also come. We have 30 early uh, member openings, so you can come before the aquarium opens and kind of get it a little bit to yourself and have uh, a little bit more privacy and a little bit calm and kind of also get to see us a little bit more, the Aquarius kind of preparing for opening. So that's another um, cool part of our uh, 30th birthday celebration. Uh, and then we're also initiating a conservation initiative called Adventure Aquarium Acts. So um, basically getting involved with different conservation organizations. And part of that is to fundraise uh, $30,000 in the year of 2022 to support those conservation organizations. So again, giving back it to the community in that way and promoting that conservation. Very cool. And y'all do more than just the the, the stuff for the birthday. Um, I mentioned the sensory friendly, mm -hmm. you know, nights and that, that was, that was cool. Yeah. <laughs> that was really cool. And well, okay. I'm, I'd be lying. I was going to say this was my favorite part, but my favorite part was meeting Cassie. But, um, <laughs> the, um, seeing the families that did come yeah. and it wasn't a huge group of people, which I think was part of the point, but, and seeing, um, especially some of the, the, the kids with special needs and stuff being able to really experience this place kind of on their own terms. And, um, I watched one family in particular and a kid just lost. It was just screaming and like, because of those issues not being misbehaved yeah. and you could tell that the parents weren't looking around yeah. and didn't feel judged. And the one time it happened right in front of uh, like 12 staff members. And even then they weren't embarrassed and none of the staff reacted poorly because A, why would you to begin with? But B, because um, that was the purpose of the night. Right. And seeing that was really special. Um, I know that that meant a lot to those families and to, you know, I thought that was really cool. Um, and then obviously we do the, the, the month things or the week things like, like sea turtle awareness. And yeah. And so we have that. our yeah. um, different awareness weekends throughout uh, the year, we're going to have a whole awareness months. Um, so there's one for sea turtles, one for sharks, one for hippos, and one for penguins. So All of which we'll have a podcast episode exactly. this year. Yay! So you'll learn a little bit more in depth about those, but you can come and check them out. We'll have all sorts of fun games and activities to really get involved with and raise awareness for those animals and also raise money to uh, help conservation organizations that help those animals. That's awesome. Yeah, I, I think it's, it's cool how much extra stuff there is. And then there's yeah. also New Year's Eve afternoony type stuff and that <laughs> kind of thing. And even, um, okay. So I have to ask and, and I, I, I'm only asking because I already know the answer, but, um, mermaids. Yes. Yeah. Mermaids here. Now, spoiler alert to everyone who listens to this <laughs> podcast. Mermaids don't actually exist in the real world. Sorry. Just have to point that out. And it used to drive me crazy that a science institution that I love and respect <laughs> would have mermaids because like that, 
you know, it doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But can you speak to why there are mermaids and, and the positive effect that they have? Because I know they do. Yeah. So um, it's definitely just kind of another magical thing for the kids and to be able to come and see um, not only the mermaids in the water, but interacting with them out of the water. And it's also very cool to see these mermaids that are coming in. They care about conservation too. And this is another way for them to help spread that message. And like, it's a way that really draws the kids in and you know, the kids love to hear about it. And so the mermaids talk about the animals, you know, like these are my friends and you know, the ocean is my home and we have to take care of it. So it's just another awesome way to draw that in and kind of keep that magic as well. That's, that is, that is cool. I will say it. it's cool. <laughs> I still, it still makes me feel a little weird seeing mermaids, but I respect the idea behind it. Yes. And I, I heard through the grapevine that like y'all's numbers are out of control when you have mermaids. Oh my gosh, it's crazy. <laughs> yeah. Which is great because then those kids are also getting the conservation messaging. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. I will begrudgingly accept <laughs> All right. So um, awesome. With all of that said, and and you've done, you've been such a great ambassador for the aquarium. Um, are there any external uh, conservation organizations you want to give a shout out to? Uh, well, definitely to the Plastic Wave Project, which is uh, part of the initiative that we're doing with the microplastic sorting. Um, and then one of my favorites is the Sea Turtle Conservancy, which is where all of the money uh, raised for our sea turtle awareness goes. Um, and being super involved with these sea turtles and having helped raise sea turtle hatchling to be uh, re-released in the wild, uh, it's kind of holds a special place in my heart as well. I love it. And yeah, <laughs> I actually discovered Sea Turtle Conservancy through you in yeah. particular and, and through that experience. So, um, and I'm a big fan and have been following and, and supporting and donating ever since. So awesome. yeah, yeah. Thank you for that. It's so fun to me to be able to share with you a little bit of the impact that you've had on other people through me without knowing it. You were just like being nice to me yeah. and doing your job and like, like cool stuff. And it's so nice for me to be able to look at you now and be like, yeah, no, you have raised money for that group through me. You have helped me decide to do a conservation podcast and, and share that word. Like, and you didn't know any of that and you just keep doing the thing. And it's so cool to see, um, you know, when seeds are planted and, and, and to be able to share with you that that has happened a little bit has no, been it's awesome. Cool. And it, it means a lot to me as well Thank to you. be able to see, see that in action, see my actions being spread further. Yeah. And I'm just one dude who knows. Exactly. You know, it's really cool <laughs> to think about. You never know uh, who you're impacting and uh, to take it from that sweet, wonderful thing to the complete opposite. It's time now, don't you know? We've come to the end of the show. But there's one tale left to go. You're gonna laugh and say, oh no. It's time for the Ron Safari Poop Story. Hit me. Um, well, uh, as you know, one of our sea turtles, uh, his name is Ozzy. <laughs> Did someone already do this one? No. Oh my god. Y'all, you're going to get this story in that... another episode, but I'm leaving this in because Ozzy is the most disgusting sea turtle he... ever is what I have learned. Oh, I feel so bad now for picking on him, but <laughs> yeah, he, um, he can be real smelly with his poops. Um, so it's kind of like a running joke. Anytime we do any type of work with Ozzy doing a physical, he always poops and he always poops on the person that's handling him. So it's kind of like, oh, who's who's going to get the poop today? <laughs> uh, but one day we did uh, we were doing a physical and brought him up on the sea turtle dock, uh, which is just floating right on top of Ocean Run. But we wanted to bring him up there to get a closer look. And he pooped when he was up there and it smelled so bad as soon as you got upstairs it was just a horrible horrible scent that just lingered for days and um our uh, one of my uh bosses he was down on the dock and was physically gagging like i thought he was gonna throw up from the smell <laughs> i was cracking up from it but yeah not to not to pick on ozzy anymore but he he can he can be a real smelly animal. <laughs> I now have this dream that just all five episodes from here will just have Aussie poop stories. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to do this and, and for everything, really. Yeah, of course. Hey, what can I say? I think Alex made a huge splash at the top of our Adventure Aquarium series. No? 
No, I, I'm, I apologize for that pun. Not really, though. Y'all know me. Y'all love them. Or y'all listen despite them. Either way, uh, I had an absolute blast catching up with someone who was, uh, you know, a bit of an old friend while also not someone I knew super well and uh, making that, that connection a little bit deeper. I thought that was really cool. And I'm excited to have shared that with you. And like I said at the top of this episode, there's a lot more adventure coming, some soon, some later, uh, but I'm I'm really excited to help you all feel like it is as special of a place as it is. I can't wait to share all of those different elements with you. And the cool thing about this episode to me was that, you know, we were avoiding talking about some of the most famous and coolest animals at the aquarium, and it was still great. But wait until you hear about those penguins, those hippos, those sea turtles, and those sharks. Oh, y'all, we are going on a journey together, and I really love that you're here for it. You can check out Adventure Aquarium online at adventureaquarium.com and on social media at Adventure Aquarium. And uh, go have a piece of cake because we're celebrating my birthday and their birthday. Yay! And remember, friends, the word credits backwards is Stiderk. The Ross Safari Podcast is produced, hosted, and engineered by John Rossi. Editing and fact-checking by John and Dr. Zoe Vesley Gross. Our theme song is Sevens by Nathan Burke, performed by Nathan and John. Interrupting John theme and additional voices by Taylor Isaac Gray. You can reach John directly on Instagram and Facebook at Ross Safari or by email at rossafaripod at gmail.com. Ross Safari is part of the Daydreamer Media Network. Now, stop listening to me and go visit a zoo.